You're all dying to know who the climate action community is, and I'm very proud to be the chair. And we are professionals at all levels who work within and around digital cultural heritage sector, as we all do in Europeana. But we acknowledge that climate change is an emergency and believe that cooperative action is required to reverse this momentum. And that's why we're here today, to talk about climate action. Uh, just to introduce the, the two steering groups and our communities. Yes, of course, we are not doing this alone and we have a nice steering group. You can see the people here in front of us. And why are we co-hosting this session? We are about communication. And if communication is always important, how to communicate. And I think especially regarding climate change. Then I experienced so many conversations that were driving people apart, unfruitful discussions. In my neighborhood, many people stopped listening to news and watching television because they are getting mad. We have to integrate climate change and all the problems uh, connected in our lives, and I am missing that. And the third thing I always am asking myself, how is this for young people, for kids? How do we communicate climate change in a way that really helps? Thank you. And our second community, the climate community, and this is our brilliant steering group. Uh, we have one, some 150 members and uh, in the community, and we're the youngest community in Europe. There are altogether seven communities, uh, and this brings together a lot of skill sets in people for people in the field, um, from professional engineers to academics. And together, we have we have built a new work plan. We're beginning to think about how we can in the digital in the cultural heritage. Uh, sector in um, in digital uh, transformation, how we can make a difference. So I'm very happy to invite our three speakers. Uh, we're going to hear first and foremost from Elna Nord from the Nordiska Muse Museum uh, and talking about the Arctic and a very sad story while the ice is melting. So Elna Nord from the museum will introduce the approach taken with the Arctic. When the, when the exhibition, um, and you'll hear about how she communicated through the exhibition and learned the challenges of running an exhibition, sadly, acknowledging the impact of climate change and get insights about the impact of the exhibition. So over to you, Elna. Okay, I will, I will start with reading a text for you. With the North Pole as its axis, directly under the North Star, where the meridians meet and the time zones end, where winter has no light and summer no darkness, this is where the Arctic begins. This is the written introduction to the exhibition The Arctic While the Ice is Melting that opened at Nordiska Museet in Stockholm in the autumn of 2019. It was a result of a three-year project that connected researchers from universities and museums in the Nordic countries, but also journalists artists and citizens with experience of working and living in the Arctic area. And my name is Elna and I am director of exhibition at Nordiska Museet in Stockholm. It has been three years since we opened the exhibition and five years since I started up the exhibition project. So it's a long time ago now, but I will try to recall some of the early path choices we made that I think made the exhibition successful in terms of communicating climate change. Nordiska Museet is Sweden's largest museum of cultural history. We have more than one and a half million exhibits, all with their own unique history. The Arctic, while the ice is melting, tells about survival in an extreme climate and invites the visitors to look at the Arctic objects in the museum in a new light. A significant part of the objects displayed in the exhibition are from Sápmi in the Arctic area of northern Sweden. The Sámi are indigenous people in Sweden and one of five national minorities. One important aim with this exhibition was to tell about Sámi culture in an Arctic context. We wanted to show that the snow and ice cultures found in the Arctic share both conditions and challenges due to climate change. 
And in the exhibition, we tilt the globe and look at the world from the north. Many Europeans have since long ago seen the Arctic as the most remote, a frozen landscape, pure nature, uninhabited. But the exhibition made clear that people have lived in the Arctic for thousands of years, and today, four million people live here. And it all began when Lotte and Gustafsson Rainius, in the center of this collage, became our new professor in ethnology. She was employed to run a research project named Life in the Arctic in the Light of Climate Change. And academics in both social and natural sciences from throughout the Nordic world generously shared their research in seminars, lectures, and articles. The aim and the method in the project was to build bridges between different disciplines and knowledges. And both scientists and people working and living in the Arctic participated. Personal experiences met research, and natural scientists met archaeologists, anthropologists, and museum curators, and perspectives were shared. And this was very important both for the research project and for the exhibition. The exhibition team participated in the research seminars and the exhibition developed alongside the research project. And when we had finalized the concept and the design sketches, we presented these to the researchers and received feedback. And in this way, we, de we developed a form of peer review system for exhibitions that worked very well. For a period of time, it was emotionally draining to process alarming research reports on a daily basis. And of course, we were all affected. And those of us who were not previously familiar with the subject were shocked to realize the urgency of the crisis. And we discussed a lot how we could convey this story without making a pitch black presentation how would we even get people to decide to come to the museum and pay admission to be told that they are in a really bad situation? However, to be affected was also necessary to make this exhibition. And we decided on a few important starting points. One, climate change is a scientific fact. And two, the exhibition must make space for many voices and many different experiences of climate change. And three, we must not isolate history from present. And four, we must not isolate nature from the culture. Our close collaboration with researchers gave knowledge. It became clear for us that people are resources. Humans are the problem, but also the solution. And this is also what researchers in the field of resilience are pointing out. If we can find ways of collaborating and connect knowledges, we can create change. And therefore, we decided to focus on people's creativity, adaption and resilience in the Arctic. And we decided that our, our method to communicate this should be beauty, poetry and research. By this, we hope to get the visitor to feel reverence for the nature and for humanity. And we wanted to point out the gap between the long history of nature and the short history of humanity, but also that the fear for extinction is something that we share with all the people who have lived before us. And we call this feeling existential vertigo. It was our professor that came up with that. And that was the feeling we strive to achieve. And from that, we developed a dramaturgy for the exhibition that looked like this in a sketch. And uh, we wanted to start with a breathtaking introduction of the Arctic nature and the ice. And we wanted to end the exhibition by presenting research about resilience, or to put it simple, humanity's capacity to handle climate change. And next step was to find a designer who understood and shared our vision. We asked four design teams 
to make a proposal and found Musia, a brilliant design duo, who came up with a breathtaking idea. Their proposal was a huge iceberg with a rift placed in the center of the Grand Hall of the Museum. And we got blown away when we saw their draft, craft and their decision. And the decision to choose them was very easy. And this oh, is the- Sorry, you have, you have two minutes? Two minutes? Three minutes, yeah, sorry. Okay, this is the result of the concept and the design. As a visitor, you can talk, walk into the iceberg and through the rift, where you will encounter narratives and objects linking the present to the past, connecting science to mythology, and presenting a poetic story about the past and the future of the daily lives of people in the Arctic. And we also asked the text consultant with an artist background to transform the exhibition text into a more poetic language. She put a lot of effort in the headlines and used a vivid language. And this is an example from the room that we came to call, came to call the panic room. And her method was really been, ha, has really been appreciated by our visitors. People are indeed reading most of the text in the exhibition, and this is kind of unusual in exhibitions. And here is some more beautiful pictures from the exhibi exhibition. This is the ice room, the room about movement, about home, about resources. And in the end of exhibition, the visitor can choose to make a pledge. You choose a topic, and you get suggestions of what changes you can do in your on a personal level. And this is from the uh, from the opening of the exhibition. I've been asked to say something about the impact of the exhibition. And number one, we opened the exhibition in a window of opportunity. It was in the autumn of 2019, and Geta Thunberg had in initiated her climate strike, Fridays for Future, and everyone was talking about the climate issue. The Crown Princess of Sweden opened the exhibition, and we got great publicity in news and in social media. And this is some examples of that. But I think... It's uh, worth mentioning that shortly after the opening, the Nordic foreign ministers met at the museum for a panel discussion about challenges in the Arctic. And to summarize, half a million people has visited the museum since the exhibi exhibition opened, and one million people has visited the, the website of the exhibition, and 56,000 visitors has left the climate pledge, either in the exhibition or on the website. So my plan was to stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, that's amazing. Um, it's very sad that such a gorgeous exhibition is reflecting such a terrible subject. Okay, Bridget, uh, I'll move the slides for you. Um, it's, uh, we're very happy for you to join us. Um, okay. <coughs> Shall I introduce you? Are you okay? Um, um, the, you, you go ahead, yes. Yeah, the Climate Museum it was founded by Bridget herself and is an experimental museum gathering, curating responses to the Earth crisis. A collection of creatives distributed across the UK, passionate about the planet, well, we all agree there. We produce and gather art, objects, ideas, games, and books, and then use these to activate people. And these activations help people to, to play, make, think, and talk about the earth crisis and to open up their imaginations to possible futures. Over to you, Bridget, and let me know when you want me to move the slides. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about communicating about or activating against the earth crisis. So um, uh, if you could just move on to the next slide I, and the next again. Um, some of the key themes I'll bring up um, are, I'll describe Climate Museum UK as an experimental museum in an uncertain time. I'll talk a bit about um, the importance of declaring emergency 
So that means that um, leadership or, you know, our professional work in this broad sector of conservation has to be fundamentally about conserving life on Earth because it's threatened. And I'll talk a bit more about audiences and how we need to work on activating them for system change and a little bit about the role of digital in enabling this. So I hope I'll cover all that in the 10 minutes available. The next slide, please. And so this term, the earth crisis, we tend, um, so although the title of our organization is Climate Museum UK, we realized quite early on that um, as Elna said, you know, there are issues with attracting people to, to deal with something with the, the word climate in the title. Um, and also the word, the term climate is, um, is like a, 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 a limited focus because um, the situation we have is actually multiple breached planetary boundaries. And so we use um, frameworks like this Earth Crisis uh, Blinkers tool to help people understand the broad range of impacts and solutions so that we're not just focusing on uh, climate or carbon. And we try not to use climate change as a coverall term for this situation. So uh, the next slide, um, a little bit about the uh, about Climate Museum UK. So we are, we don't have a venue. Uh, we aren't able to create um, spectacular experiences like the wonderful looking Arctic exhibition. Um, we're an experimental museum that is really challenging the notion of what museums can be at this time. Um, not just museums, but the wider cultural sector. And we're curating and gathering emerging responses to the earth crisis as it happens. So we're very much a contemporary collecting uh, organization. We're also unusual by being distributed. So we are a collective of creative people who are based across the UK and we work online and in our local places. So we make and we gather art and objects and ideas by working with people. And we use these experiences to activate people. So the rather than exhibitions, we do activations. That's the main name for our, our programming. Um, and these help people to play and make and think and talk in very active ways and to re really open their imagination to possible futures and then to decide how they might take action, not just in, within their own domestic sphere, but to really expand that sphere. So they're becoming more social, more communal, um, more working in their business or their political spheres of influence. The next slide, please. So just a couple of examples of the activations that we do. Um, uh, well, I said that when we when we've organized things with Climate Museum UK as the main title, people are sometimes put off. So we use alternative titles like the Wild Museum. And in this picture on the left, you can see we've dressed up as animal curators. So um, badger, beetle, magpie and squirrel have brought their own collections of um, of coal and uh, invasive species of seeds. And, um, and rubbish and have um, shown their museums to children and then given children clay to, to make a wilder, more regenerative museum. And on the right, um, Hub Wren, it's a regenerative hub. Amy Scaife has a collection of resources of posters and books and art, and she takes it in a, a cargo bike out to markets and festivals to have conversations with people where they are. So um, just moving on. Um, to the idea about declaring emergency. So we're involved a lot in the professional cultural sector, um, doing training and advocacy. And we're working very closely with the movement that I co-founded um, called Culture Declares Emergency. So it's a growing movement. It's actually international with local hubs of cultural workers who are uh, telling the truth, facing the truth about the earth crisis and working together to uh, take action and to seek justice. Um, next slide. And in this um, 
relationship with culture declares emergency, we've developed this framework called Culture Takes Action, which expands the um, the, the the categories of the the response of culture to this crisis. So it isn't just about decarbonizing. Um, it's opening up to that full range of earth crisis impacts and looking at all of the possible ways we can create a safe and just space for humanity within the limits of, of the planet. So by doing this, we're asking what if we put culture in the donut of Kate Rayworth's donut economics? And we run, you know, pr uh, camp social media campaigns highlighting good practice in these categories. Um, next slide. And we use these uh, training approaches and campaigns to try to get people to really see what's wrong and then to work with their audiences to see what's possible, to prefigure what's possible. So essentially, we're moving from a degenerative culture to a regenerative one. Um, next slide. And a degenerative culture is rooted in histories of extractivism. So we're in museums and um, heritage able to really analyze and explore how human activity it has been harmful by extracting not just mineral resources, but also, you know, moving up this um, pyramid to extracting cultural resources and people's knowledge and data and power. Um, moving on uh, the next slide. So in thinking in a non extractive way, a more regenerative way about our audiences, we have to bear in mind, you know, how this extractive system um, is treating people as consumers. Um, so in the cultural sector, you know, when we see people only as audiences, we're not seeing their power, we're only seeing them as people who might come to visit us. Um, so we need to start seeing them more more as communities of interest and particularly we have to see them as ecosystem inhabitants you know humans live in the biosphere this biosphere is collapsing and traumatized so we need to work with people to help them effect system change next slide and um i will stop when my time has run out um I think, uh, let me just tell you um our third speaker hasn't appeared so okay I very happy for you to continue and then we'll have okay. some questions at the end and okay. as soon as he turns up we'll let you know so okay because we're enjoying what you're saying okay thank you so we um in thinking about audiences we're um thinking psychologically actually informed by echo psychology um and one of the practitioners in this area is dr renee lertzman who has this golden trine of behavior change so she has analysed how people respond to conflicting information, information that conflicts with their desires for a comfortable and stable life. And there are three main responses. The first is denial. People just don't want to know. They fail to explore the truth. The second is disavowal, which is this is nothing to do with me. And so they fail to make personal sense of the situation. They don't put themselves in the picture. And the third response is maybe increasingly common as more and more of us are accepting the science, but we are rationalizing. So we're creating simple uh, pathways or jumping too fast into action. Um, and Renee's golden trine, she identifies ways we might tackle these responses at the corners. So helping people learn and discover, making sense and process, and taking really effective action together. And the next slide shows really how the cultural sector, museums, and heritage can help by looking to the past to help people learn and discover truths and histories, um, for example, of trauma and biocolonialism, um, dealing with the present, you know, making sense of this emotional and social trouble that we're in as things change so rapidly, supporting people's mutual care and resilience. And then thirdly, we need to start looking much more to the future um, so that we can help people envisage the future they want and take action, um, you know, growing an appetite for system change. 
And just the next slide, I'll just briefly tell you about some research that I worked on. This isn't with my Climate Museum UK hat on, but my research company, Flow Associates, um, working with the uh, Science Museum Group in the UK, the Museum of Tomorrow in Brazil, and the um, National Council of Science Museums in India. So we looked at the role of sustainable food um, you can read the report and the appendices. There's a huge amount to learn there. But a key thing that we found is that people. So one route, one thing is that food is actually a really fantastic way in to engage people because it offers many multi solving opportunities for change. And you don't have to start with this off putting word climate or, you know, trouble. You can start with the positive. The other thing is, though, that people didn't necessarily see um, museums as the ideal spaces for engaging with a topic like sustainable food. They were talking more about um, the most effective communication being in retail spaces and restaurants and farms. And they said that they'd been really um, influenced by broadcast media. So, you know, audio, audio visual content. So, you know, these are two aspects that we need to think about when we think that our, um, our cultural spaces are the most effective places to engage people. Um, we need to be perhaps working much more where people are online and in this, you know, real lived world. And the other finding in the next slide is that um, people have responses that fall into one of these three categories. People are either very um, focused on self and family. And so the kind of solutions that might appeal to them are much more to do with um, uh, personal health or, you know, being good parents. Um, then the second approach is where people are really focused on social organizing and concerns about social equality or access to land. And the third concern uh, set of concerns is when people are very driven by the big picture, by the science and by big ethics like animal uh, harm. And we were exploring in the research how um, people need to be nudged closer together to understand each other's values and essentially we need to encourage people who are focused on self and family to be more interested in ways to organize for their family's benefit um, in more communal ways and people who are very abstract or ethical in their concerns equally need to come closer to understanding, you know, the concerns of individuals and families. So, you know, these are maybe some kind of ethics that can inform the design of our services. And just finally, the next uh, two slides are really about um, how we might need to think about digital leadership. Um, in the cultural sector. So these are the various uh, realms of leadership in, in our sectors, um, educational, moral, ecological, conservation, financial, and digital sort of sits in this corner of efficiency. And all of these are informed by literate wise leadership. So we need to be literate about the earth crisis amongst other things. Um, and the next slide, so my proposition is that all forms of leadership, but also, you know, in particular, digital leadership needs to be um, leading, leading cultural organizations into this ecological direction to become more literate in general and more ecological in purpose or mission. So that is my last slide. And um, I'm. Yeah, I'm open to discussion and questions if there's more time if uh, the third speaker isn't isn't oh, here Richie, thank you very much you've given us a lot of food for thought um and as we can take this opportunity of having a few more extra minutes i see there was already somebody with a hand up mariana was that you oh okay yeah can we have a have, but first of all can everybody turn on their um the cameras so we can see our participants would be lovely hello everybody hi eva <laughs> randy Oh, this is lovely. This is our, and uh, a lot of people from our community are here. 
Um, and what I want to ask before you, first of all, you're very well, very welcome to ask Brigitte a question, but is anybody in the audience thinking about these same things and working, hi Nelson, and working in the community or their exhibitions or their museums or their libraries doing something similar? Because we'd love to hear from you. Ah, oh, good, Elna, you're still here. So we can have questions for either Brigitte or Elna. Um, or we would love to hear from anybody in the audience who would like to share their experiences. Don't forget to turn on your mic. Tom, hello, Tom. Hi, how are you? <laughs> would you like to ask a question? Very well. When I can, when I can finally take my mute map button off. Thanks, Yay. Susan. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> um, yeah, it's this. Um, uh, I just wanted to share that the, the, the uh, uh, British Library. Um, hello, Bridget. Um, uh, we have started a, a sustainability group and uh, it's it's really quite active and we're thinking really carefully about all parts of the um, library activities which which will have an impact um, and um, everybody's everybody sort of contributes um, well why are we doing this and why are we using all of this and why are we chucking all, all this out and there's there's, um, it's a very active community for sort of looking at possible problems, yeah, uh, possible solutions. Um, and um, the person who was sort of really active in starting the whole thing off has now gone on to be head of sustainability at uh, University College London. Um, and these sustainability roles are starting to sort of take traction um, which is great because um, I think, you know, institutions are starting to invest in um, staff who will look at, at issues and be sort of pushing for, for solutions. So it's, there's, there's, it's not just a sort of um, individual saying we've got to stop this, but um, the institutions who are sort of saying, yes, that's a good point, we could do this, that and the other. Um, so um, I, I, um, I think there's a, a huge a lot, a huge amount that still needs to be done, but um, uh, it's, it's, um, it's heartening that, um, that there is such an interest in, in, um, in our sector. Thank you, Tom. I don't think it's just an interest, there's a dire need in our sector. We all have to put our shoulders together and get our hands dirty and do it, I think. Um, uh, so anybody else would like to share their experience or questions to Elna and Brigitte would be very welcome. Um, I, I think the big issue that both of you mentioned is that it's extremely hard in communicating such a democrat, such a, um, a sad and uh, frightening subject. You know, our climate is in danger. We are in danger. And as soon as you sort of start talking about climate and uh, this sort of thing, you, you're turning people off right at the beginning before you even start. So you both have found ways into it. Perhaps you'd like to talk about that, Elna, when you first came up with the subject, was it welcomed in the community? And then uh, Brigitte, I'd love to hear from you as well. In the, at the museum, you mean, or? Um, when, I, when, I, I, when I was employed at the museum, it was already, uh, they had already been working for one year with this. I don't know how it was, I think the most, for, for the museum staff, it was most that the Arctic topic was kind of new, that we were out, outside Sweden. So that was no, I think that was the most strange thing to talk about climate. I don't think anyone hesitated to do that. And that was three years ago. Five years ago. Five years ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. But now, if you see the exhibition now, would be received differently? I think everyone is very proud here that we made the exhibition and we got such a everyone was everyone loved the exhibition and so many people we increased our visitors number we thought no one would come and and we increased our the numbers of people coming here the first three months was almost double I think is that because of the subject or they heard that the exhibition was so attractive because it goes from what from... I think it was both. As I said, it was <clears throat> in the autumn of 2019, and climate change was 
the big thing. Uh, and then COVID came <laughs> mm -hmm. and we all forgot about it and we had other problems. Uh, but by then it was, I think everyone, they wanted to see it, they wanted to be engaged. Mm -hmm. They wanted to talk about it. So I think it it became an area or a place to talk about it. And now we have to put it back on the agenda with the, the terrible actions in Ukraine at the moment um, are distracting people yet again. Was from we we hopped from uh, lurched from from COVID now to what's happening to this very cold winter that a lot of people are going to be facing this year. Um, and how can we keep climate on the agenda, Bridget? How do you keep people engaged? Yes, I think, I mean, I've maybe simplified the situation because, you know, there is a demand and an interest in what we offer, but it depends on the context and the audience and who you're really trying to engage. Um, and so, for example, when we're developing activities for a family audience and we're maybe in, in for example, we're quite often in a, in a open day or a festival type situation where there are many other choices and um, children will go for choices that are, you know, as as fun as possible. Um, and so we have to kind of, you know, we have to compete. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is, though, is that um, young people, te teenagers and um, people in their 20s um, are, are very frustrated when climate and environmental issues and their concerns about the future are, um, are ignored. You know, where if, if, for example, we make assumptions about what young people are concerned about without asking them, um, we did some research uh, as part of a listening project where we consulted with young people and adults and the young people were the most frustrated that that their fears about the future were uh, about and about not just fears about the future but their ideas on how to tackle this situation that they were you know just sort of bracketed out and ignored um and and their views were often very political, you know, and it was identifying the relationship between gross inequalities and and you know the the kind of exploitations of land and places that lead to the earth crisis. And they can see, you know, what needs to be done. Younger people have very clear, um, you know, solution focused ideas. For example, we need to just stop the extraction of of oil and gas and and coal. Um, and then adults tend to equivocate and, um, you know, and us in cultural organisations tend to worry about our, you know, um, we, uh, our neutrality. Um, so, you know, what we really need to be doing is not just sort of putting on programmes that tell a story outwards, but, but being much more democratic. So it isn't really about whether we call, call programmes um, what they are or not. It's about what our audiences want and not just treating them as audiences, but treating them with people with voice and agency. That's absolutely right. Um, anybody in, in the in our steering group from the communicators like to jump in with a question? I, I just um, I'm, I'm just back to you, Bridget. One more question. Sorry. Um, what do you tell young people who say stop oil now? You know, what, what can we say? What, how can we answer something like that? Obviously, that's the, the right thing to say, but how can we? Um, I would help them to think about the um, the ways that the fossil fuel industry um, influences society through media and culture. Um, so looking at the mechanisms so that they're equipped because young people, activists in general, feel the need for more information before they can um decisively communicate and act so i think our role is to open up our assets so that we're not just saying here is all of the material you can discover but here here's all the material and here's what we know about the structures of power and exploitation so it's yeah it's all about equipping them really and i think adults need that equipping as well not just young people yeah yeah. Um, Mariana, you, you have a very, Mariana, you just disappeared. Are you here, Are Mariana? Oh, good, yeah. Yeah, you had a very good point. Do you want to articulate that? Do you want to put your, turn off your mute? No? You, you want me to call out the question? I like your question. 
Okay, shall I call it out? It's really good. You remember when you were in school? Uh, I mean, a public room. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, oh, you can't speak. Okay, but no, it's really speak. important. You know, everybody was talking about the ozone hole, and then suddenly everybody stopped talking about it. And I, I didn't understand that either. And you say you have a National Geographic cover with a big iceberg on the back, and that was in 1982. So we've lost many years, and that's a really important point. We can't lose any more years. We don't have time. So uh, anybody else would like to jump in with a question or comment? Can I just quickly comment in response to that? And I'm sorry if I'm dominating a bit, but um, El Elna Elnan has now left and the other speaker's not here. So, yeah. um, <laughs> and it, it goes back further because in 1972, there was the Limits to Growth report, which really summarised everything that was wrong, <laughs> you know, and, and the scientists have known about, about climate change and the causes, um, you know, for 170 years so, you know, anyway. So what are the next urgent steps ahead? Well, um... I have a question here from Randy. Did you, there's a question here. Um, can you talk more about regenerative culture as a framework? That sounds like a very positive framing. Yes, yes. Um, so it, there's a bit of discussion about um, about whether we need to move from being sustainable to regenerative and and to the and the extent to which regenerative is is much more radical um so the the definition might be that with sustainability you are just reducing the harm of your existing activities in order to sustain your existing activities and the sort of stability of life as it is whereas regenerative culture um is is about recognizing that um, life as it is is changing anyway because the the earth crisis is disrupting everything and it is about taking really quite um uh comprehensive action um and changing the structures of society in order to collaborate together and imagine um entirely new ways of doing things that are in harmony with um with the biosphere um and driven in really entirely by um uh, regenerating ecosystems in order to provide um the means to thrive for all species and not just humans so it, it's i guess quite a deep green approach um but uh but it's important for us not to um judge sustainable actions for being imperfect you know we need to bring everyone with us and make the regenerative culture a really positive optimistic and achievable vision yeah uh, nelson so i'm in the same silent room but i'll have to talk now so uh just transforming that theory in a practical example if you're going to do a new neighborhood at least you can do the neighborhoods that complements what's missing around you. For instance, charging spots, uh, electric car charging spots, uh, renewable energy, etc. That will be so much ex more expensive to fit into existing neighborhoods. So you can, you should be obliged to plan that ahead. The fact is that current legislation does not really allow you to do regenerative neighborhoods. But that's another conversation. Mm, thank you, Nelson. Uh, I just want to say something in response to you, Brigitte, and what you said that we we it's very difficult to maintain the momentum when you see uh, all the all these awful actions and results around you. You know, your your neighborhood is flooded, your river has dried up, your back garden has a forest fire, your house is on fire. And you look and you, th and you think, well, what can we do? You know, we can't talk to China, we can't talk to India. Um, or the whole of the United States, uh, we have to do something in, and we have to do something that helps us. Um, and I think this very small localized, if possible, uh, focused action in the end will actually um, will work out. And I was I was very despo despondent the other day and a friend of mine said, um, you know, we've been talking about plastic containers and supermarkets and plastic wrappings for ages and ages. And then suddenly, very quietly, you go to the supermarket and things are now wrapped in paper. You don't see so much cellophane. So actions are taking place quietly. 
um, behind the scenes and gives me hope that whatever actions we decide to take as a community will have impact at some level. And sometimes the smaller actions accumulate and have ripple effects and create larger actions. So not to give up. <laughs> um, uh, Tom, did you have uh, a question before? Sorry. Yes, uh, well, it was it was a comment which is um, something I was thinking of from from the morning session about um, abuse of uh, of storytelling uh, and you know uh, and um, misinformation or disinformation and I, I think this is also a very big um, problem um, where where you know we know now that millions of pounds or dollars or whatever whatever currency have been poured into um, uh, uh, saying, well, there's not a problem. Um, and we're not having- Who is impact. saying that? Who is saying that, Tom? Well, um, oil, oil lobbies are, have been funding that, um, that mis misinformation um, and- um and some uh for example um sort of media companies uh, uh the bbc got call, called out for for doing too much false equivalence and saying oh well there's this expert here who says that climate change is 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 happening and we've got to do something but then there's another one here um and he doesn't um and and that was a false equivalence uh, and and they were criticized for that so i mean i think you know this is this is uh the uh, it's it's yet another battle of information um as well as um you know a, a, as well as uh activities that we've got to do we've also got to think about what what the what the the kind of um opposing narrative is that's so true. That's so true. Um, uh, he Kelly, would you like to ask the question yourself or would you like me to phrase it for you? Because that's really important. Kelly, would you like to jump in? Uh, yes, sorry, I'm also in that same room <laughs> where everyone else is. So my question is uh, following on a bit from what was mentioned this morning about how outrage is perhaps not the most productive or most useful emotion to evoke when trying to encourage change. And then, as you were saying, Bridget, that people in their teens or in their twenties, and as myself as a person like that, that is often the emotion that I feel. So I was wondering what your perspective on that is, um, especially with your approach of activations of how mm -hmm. does outrage figure into that? Mm -hmm. Well, I believe that uh, no emotion should be repressed, and that we need to create. Um, uh, spaces that allow for the expression of diverse emotions and for those to be um, channeled. <laughs> and so outrage is absolutely um, acceptable given the situation we're in. And um, so when Tom was talking about, you know, the control of the narrative, um, you know, part of that is about creating a kind of monocultural response or to sort of determine what's an acceptable response or not and so um what we need actually is a is a is a a wide range of responses and it relates to what susan was saying about you know about effective action so we need on one hand you know angry people <laughs> people like greta you know really furious you know and speaking on that stage about you know really shaming those leaders and mm. and then that pushes the Overton window so that the moderate flank moves further to that you know further into that space of accepting um their own uh, you know working with their own anger rather than repressing it so um uh, you know yes it, outrage is good, but as soon as it spills over into uh, making other people feel um, frightened, um, it, then um, it can work if those people are the ones who are absolutely due to feel frightened. You know, the ones in power, the ones who have caused this, they actually there actually have to be structures for reparation and justice so that our outrage can be expressed to those people. Um, 
you know, so basically we don't have a system that allows for outrage, um, uh, you know, at the higher levels or, or within our culture. Um, and, and we need to enable it somehow. Thank you, Bridget. That's encouraging. Um, we have to wind up now. Uh, and I think if possible, Randy, would you would you like to take that comment now? Because I, I it's giving us a glimmer of optimism in this conversation. Because shall I read it out for you on your behalf? Yeah, because lovely. It's on Tom's point. Thank you, Tom, um, about communications marketing and the extraction industries, as uh, Nomi Klein talks about. As so many others do, I think we could look at the history of the tobacco industry as a narrative of how corporate lies got caught out and wound up costing the industry thousands, millions of dollars. And I love this phrase. Lies will eventually be called out. But how long will it take? Well, I, you're very optimistic. I'm not quite as optimistic, but let's leave this discussion on this optimistic note. Oh, uh, Tom, would you like to add something? And then just a, a wrap up comment from you, Bridget, would be lovely. Uh, mute, unmute. No, that was uh, you know I, I I agree. Yes, I'm. I mean it's um, uh, yes. Uh, these do facts facts do come to light, uh, and um, uh, yes, I I, I <laughs> we just don't know how long, but I think we it does feel like it's um, uh, more. You, you know, there feels like a bit of a gathering snowball here with uh um with that kind of uh, calling out of misinformation so i'm i'm optimistic well i hope you're both right uh bridget a quick word from you and then we're going to close the session a, a mute unmute Right. Yes, sorry. I think that we need to um, work together and Europeana provides that uh, forum um, for, for us as a sector to use digital um, platforms to, to call out these lies, to, to use culture and heritage to tell the truth, the many, many truths um, of, you know, the ways that people and places have been exploited for profit and um, that harm has been allowed to perpetuate. Um, yeah, we need to expose all of that and, mm -hmm. and not to feel ashamed uh, that, you know, not to worry that it's too political. OK, on that note, uh, let me just thank you. Well, I would say thanks to Eleanor, but she's gone. And thanks to El Elliot, who didn't even turn up. Um, but Bridget, thank you very much for your very provoking and interesting comments and a lot of material to help us think our way through this climate. Uh, yeah, climate uh, crisis that we're all in together so that's what i'll let's work together and try and do something about it thank you everybody and continue uh, enjoying the rest of the conference today and we'll see you in the next session bye for now <laughs>